We're now in session three of the Gospel of Matthew, in which we're going to focus on chapters three and four. I want to remind you of our epistemological approach. Epistemology is the study of knowledge, its scope and limits. And our epistemological approach here is to, first of all, establish the integrity of the design of these 66 books we call the Bible. Even though it was penned by 40 different guys over thousands of years, we discover it has an, it's an integrated message, not just in themes, but every number, every detail, even the mathematical structures underneath the text. We now discover evidence, a design from end to end that's absolutely astonishing. Once you discover its integrity of design, you realize it had to have its origin from outside the time domain. And one of the primary things it does is it establishes the identity of Jesus Christ. It's astonishing to realize that most people on the planet Earth have no idea who Jesus Christ is. They have no idea. They have notions. They use great this and great that, and they have various traditions. They don't really understand that it's the Creator Himself incarnate. Once you establish that identity, He, of course, authenticates the whole package. So that's our epistemological approach. Integrated design, 66 separate books penned by 40 different guys over several thousand years, a design which anticipates in detail, precisely, events before they happen. And once you realize the, the, the extent to which that occurs, you, you come to the obvious conclusion that the origin of this message had to come from outside our time domain. The Gospels each have a different focus. Matthew, being a Jew, presents Jesus as the Messiah. Mark as a servant. Luke as the Son of Man, His humanity. John the Son of God. The genealogies reflect that. Matthew's genealogy goes from Abraham down through the legal line through Joseph. Luke's genealogy goes through Mary. It starts from Adam and goes all the way th to Mary through the bloodline. Ma Matthew emphasized what Jesus said, Mark what He did. It's a shooting script kind of thing. And Luke, what he felt, and John, who he really was. Matthew's writing to the Jew, both Mark and Luke, to the, the Gentiles, the Roman and the Greek, and John, the church. The first miracle reflects that same design, and the, the way the book ends reflects that design. Matthew ends in a very Jewish way on the resurrection, Mark, the ascension. Luke, the promise of the Holy Spirit, setting up his sequel called Luke, Volume 2, called the Book of Acts. And John ends his book with a promise of Christ's return, which of course sets up his uh, sequel, the book of Revelation. And of course, all of these reflect the four camps, the lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle, that uh, modeled the throne of God when the camp was uh, operative and so forth. And so, Matthew also emphasizes groupings, where the other snapshots and other focuses. The genealogies are worth reviewing here, Adam through Noah, which of course, if you've studied Genesis chapter 5 and translated the meaning of those names, man is appointed, mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down teaching that His death shall bring, God's death shall bring the despairing comfort or rest. An astonishing little summary of the Christian gospel tucked away in a genealogy in the Torah. Anyway, Luke's... Uh, uh, Matthew goes from Adam, uh, from Abraham down to David, and Luke's uh, gospel fills in between Noah down to Abraham. So, so far we have a cogent um, picture. We get, uh, uh, when you get to David, a lot of interesting things occur. We discover that Boaz, Obed, and Jesse, and David are predicted in the book of Ruth and also encrypted behind Genesis 38. We went through all of that before. And we went through that strange prophecy at the end of the book of Ruth, which essentially demonstrates, predicts David as king in the times of the judges, long before Samuel and the rest of it. The blood curse in Jeconiah, a key thing, that the, God pronounces a blood curse on the, uh, the descendants from Jeconiah, which of course creates a problem because that's also where the Messiah has to come from, that line. And yet that line carries a blood curse. And the way this gets resolved, of course, is that Matthew takes his genealogy through the first surviving son of Bathsheba, Solomon, and down to the legal father of Jesus Christ, Joseph. Luke, being a doctor and being interested in his humanity, takes a different path. He started from, from Adam. When you get up to David, they're consistent, but when Luke gets to David, he takes a left turn. He goes through the second surviving son of Bathsheba, Nathan, and comes down to Mary. And if we read the text carefully, we discover Joseph is the son-in-law of Eli, Mary's father. And that's from the daughters of Zelophehad, the Torah exception on inheritance, 
that was requested of Moses in Numbers 27, granted by Joshua in Joshua 17, in which if a father had only daughters and the daughters married in within the tribe, that the husband could be adopted by the father of the bride and raise up inheritance to the line. And that's even the claims of Christ hang on this peculiar exception in the Torah. This anticipates the lineage of Christ. Joseph was the son-in-law of Heli. If you check the Greek of Luke 3, verse 23, it's a nomizo reckoned as by law. He's the son-in-law, as we would say it, of Heli. The virgin birth, hinted at the Garden of Eden, prophesied by Isaiah, the virgin shall conceive, required by the blood curse in the royal line. We talked a little bit about the interesting observations uh, in the constellation of the Virgo, the virgin, and how it echoes the seed of the woman with a branch in her one hand and the ears of corn in the other. It's interesting that Virgo is associated with the tribe of Zebulon where Nazareth is located. That's another thing I thought would be useful to be sensitive to. So 14 generations there, so forth. And uh, 14, 14, but three omitted, blotted out, just as the Torah requires, because they died violent deaths because of their idolatry. So it's interesting that, that it, it at first doesn't look like it computes until you, when you find something not quite working out, you, you, if you peek in behind, you'll make a discovery that will blow you away. And we could go into more of this. Obviously, two of these are names in common in order to provide the succession, but the blood succession was through Neri of, of uh, the father of Salathiel and so forth. Okay, that was by way of review. Last time we talked about the Roman Empire, but also pointed out that the Parthian Empire was a rival in, during the period we're talking about, a couple of centuries both before and after Christ. And that buffer zone explains why Herod was so upset with these magi showing up. And, and uh, we got the three gifts that are prophetic, gold, frankincense, and myrrh that we're all familiar with, and uh, prophetic of him being prophet, priest, and king. The major lessons last time was the messianic line, that truth is in the details, the precision of the God-breathed text, we showed that in many ways, the numerics of it and so on. Hermeneutically, we learned a few things, that pattern is prophecy. Out of Egypt I've called my son and so forth. Really strange, strange use of Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. Pattern is prophetic. Often in the scripture, the person of Christ and the nation Israel are almost used interchangeably in a number of passages. Uh, Israel is called God's firstborn in Exodus 4.22. All through Isaiah, the thought shifts between the nation and the Messiah. Now, Abraham is a friend of God. Israel is spoken of as an individual. And the Spirit's upon him like an individual, meaning the nation. And then you get to, of course, the capstone of this is Isaiah 53, where the, the Jews interpret this chapter as referring only nationally, not individually. But all you have to do is read it yourself and come to your own conclusions. It's pretty obvious. Okay, so we, that's the first two chapters of of uh, Matthew. Let's jump into the next two chapters together. Chapter 3 and 4, John the Baptist and the temptation of Christ. Matthew chapter 3 verse 1, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Don't confuse him now with John the Apostle. This is a different guy of course um, and uh, not the guy that wrote five books of the New Testament. That's uh, John the Apostle. This is John the Baptist. A very interesting guy that has some aspects that many people don't realize. We'll try to highlight that as we go. Preaching the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet of Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path uh, straight. John, was, John the Baptist was born into the priesthood. His father was Zechariah, a priest. But he, uh, 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 he's preaching outside the camp. In fact, 20 miles away. It's interesting, he's going to draw such a crowd that have to go on foot. They couldn't get a rent car, drive to Jericho. You know, they had to walk. And when you take that, one of the things, if when you're there, you begin to realize what was going on, that they had so, not just a few, so many uh, came that they had to send an inquiry team to find out what's going on, but so forth. And uh, so this is what he's quoting from, from Isaiah 43, 40 verse uh, 3 to 5. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair, a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea, and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized 
of him in Jordan confessing their sins. John the Baptist. He was dressed like Elijah. John ate locusts and wild honey, which it may have been actual locusts. He might have done that. But it also could be locust, uh, pods from the locust tree, which is like a carob-like fruit. And that's a, that's, that's a very reasonable alternative. John is testifying to Jesus' pre-existence before birth because he was Jesus' cousin three months older. He's three months older than Jesus, but he treats him uh, having pre-existed. You won't pick that up unless you watch for it. He took an unyielding uh, stand against iniquity. He was uh, chosen as a herald. Many quotes on that to open the door of the sheepfold and so forth. Let's talk a little bit about chronology because that's going to affect what I'm going to show you. This chronology is not necessarily correct. There are many good scholars with different views. We know that Tiberius was appointed in 14 A.D. Augustus actually died August 19th of 14 A.D. And Tiberius was his successor. So we know from Luke chapter 3 verse 1 it was within the 15th year of Tiberius. So you don't add 15. You, 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 you have to add 14 to the year. Do you follow me? Because it's during that year. So thus the ministry began, we believe, in the fall of 28 A.D. The fourth Passover would be April 6th of 32 A.D. According to the dating of Sir Robert Anderson that we, we, we uh, rely on for a lot of other reasons too. You will find many good scholars with different views of the chronology, and that's fine. But you also need to know most of those chronologies that you'll find try to justify a Friday juice, a crucifixion. A lot of the fog lifts when you realize he wasn't, for three reasons we'll bring out when the time comes, uh, it's clear he was not crucified on a Friday. So we believe, we'll start with, I'm going to use the reconciliation from Risto Santala, translated from the Finnish, uh, about a decade ago, that uh, is, is one attempt to try to reconcile the gospel timings. There, there, there's, none of these are free of different views by good scholars, but this may be helpful. And we're going to begin in effect at Nazareth, of course, and we're going to, we're going to go down here to Bethabara, the house of passage. The, 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 the baptism took place on that side of the Jordan, interestingly enough, and we'll find this in, in John 1 and Matthew 3 and Mark 1. And... Uh, We'll go from there up to the Mount of Temptation in chapter 4. Both Matthew 4 and Luke 4 deal with that. And uh, I want you to notice where Jerusalem is with respect to Bethabara. See that distance? You're looking at like 20 miles, as I remember. That's a long walk. If you're living in Jerusalem, you want to find out what's this guy doing in, in the Jordan. Then up to Salem, according to John, then to Cana, which is Nathaniel's hometown. And that's where the first disciples, John, Peter, and Andrew, Philip, and Nathaniel, are selected in the first chapter of John. Let's move on. And when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? You know, that's pretty nasty language to use to these guys because they associate vipers with Genesis 3, the seed of the serpent. That language is not pleasant to anybody, but if you're a Pharisee, that has a, a particular bite to it, if you will. He's calling them the sons of Satan. Who hath warned you to flee, uh, to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Now from Joshua chapter 3, you may recall when they crossed from Bethabara over to the promised land, they put stones there, one for each of the 12 tribes. And I believe that John the Baptist was able to point to those stones as a memorial. You say you're, you take comfort in the fact you're sons of Abraham. I can raise up sons of Abraham from these stones, is what he's saying, see? You know, I should say God is able of these stones to raise up children to Abraham. I think he's actually pointing to those stones. By the way, Pharisees, to understand the Pharisees and Sadducees, we use those terms thrown around a lot. Pharisees technically were separatists. They were the legalists, the ritualists. Out of them came the traditions of what's now known as the Talmudic Jew. They, had their, the, the, they, they embraced what's called the oral tradition. So they added to what God had written down with things that they took very, very seriously. They were the extreme orthodox in a sense. The Sadducees were the opposite of that. They're comp comparable to the liberal, uh, liberalists uh, today, the rationalists the so-called Reformed, Modernists, Humanists, those are all equivalent. 
The Sadducees denied the inspiration of the Word of God. They did not believe in the resurrection. That's why they were sad, you see. <laughs> now, I'm sorry, that's a corny pun, but it'll help you remember which is which. It'll help you remember which is which. It's very interesting when you study your Bible, you will find some of the Pharisees and priests came to faith in Jesus Christ. The book of Acts makes mention of them. I cannot find any place in the entire Bible where a Sadducee came to faith. Doesn't mean they didn't. Don't misunderstand me. But I think it's interesting that the extreme legalists were able to overcome that and realize Christ was the answer. The liberals were too blinded, apparently. Anyway, moving on. And now also, this is John continuing, now the, also the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. We're going to talk about shoes before we're through, I believe, so let's keep moving here. Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. That was, that's, that's his preachment to him. Wow. Well, one day, this is, the kind of, this, this is what he's preaching. Then one day, guess what happens? Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee. Comest thou to me? Can you imagine? It's understandable, because he, he understood who Jesus was. In fact, it's interesting to recognize how he introduces Jesus publicly the first time. But you understand his bewilderment here. Jesus answered and said unto him, Suffered to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Once you understand, you're seeing the Trinity here. All three are visible, which is very rare. You've got the Father in terms of the voice. You've got the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove-like appearance of some kind. And uh, the Son Himself. The whole Trinity is visible here. Big deal. Let's stop here for a minute. Let's pop into John 1 because John details this so nicely for us. John chapter 1. We'll start about verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He's speaking here of John the Baptist, of course. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. But he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which are born of, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. He gave him the power to become the sons of God. That term in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew, the Benai HaHelim, is always used of a direct creation of God. Adam was a direct creation of God. You and I are not in the natural we're sons of Adam. Not a, he, was, he was a son of God. But he sinned. That gave him a genetic defect that we now have. It's called sin. Our problem is being HIV positive. Our problem is being SIN positive. But there's a blood cure, cure in either case. Okay. That word sons of God is also used of angels. And you need to understand that when you get to Genesis 6. But it's even used here in that same sense. As many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. Okay. That's why you have to be born again. That term applies. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of Him and cried, saying, "He was uh, This was He of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is before, before me, for He was before me. Strange remark for a guy that's three months older, but he, you understand, it's, obvious, it's obvious that he understood. And of His fullness have we all received grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. And this is the record of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? See, they're expecting three different guys. I'll give you, explain that in a minute. Who are you? Are you Elijah? Are you, you, know, are you that prophet? So, 
Are you the, are you, first, are you the Messiah? They're, they're trying to get, who does he think he is? He, says, he confessed, denied, no, he says, confessed, I am not the Christ. They asked him, then, what then? Art thou Elias? Elijah was predicted to return. He said, I am not. In, in Malachi chapter 4, the last few verses of the Old Testament, it was predicted that Elijah would come. So that's why it's saying, are you Elijah? He says, I am not. Art thou that prophet? Referring to the prophet of Moses in Deuteronomy 18. He said, no. Then said they unto him, well, who art thou? That we may give an answer to them that sent us. See, these guys were sent by the priest to, do a, you know, to get, a, get a report. They need an answer. What, that, what sayest thou of thyself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight in the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. He's quoting the same Isaiah 40, first, first few years there. And they which were sent were of the Pharisees. And they asked him and said unto him, why baptizest thou then if thou be not that Christ, or nor Elias, neither that prophet? You're not one of those three. That, they were expecting three different people. He's not one of those. The fact that they're expecting the Messiah is interesting because some of them may have had a sensitivity from Daniel that it, the time is ripe. Right. There's certainly some that were that, that, that we will we'll, we'll encounter those later. John answered them saying, I baptize you with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not, he it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latch it. I am not worthy to unloose. There are three anticipated. The, the Judaism was expecting three people. The Messiah, of course, at least in the generic sense. Elijah, who was promised to return in Malachi 4. And the prophet of Moses. That prophet, as they call it, Deuteronomy 18. And J John denies being any one of those three. It's interesting that Matthew 17 we'll encounter at the Transfiguration involves both Elijah and Moses, Moses present there that Peter sees. In fact, all three of them see there. And so uh, we believe that Elijah and Moses have a, have a ministry beyond their earthly ministry. And we suspect it's in described in Revelation chapter 11 that they are, might very well be the two witnesses that are there pictured. I want to talk about shoes. I find this interesting. You take any topic in the Scripture and chase it down and you'll get a little treasure. Shoes. Moses at the burning bush was told to take off his shoes. You're on hallowed ground. Remember that? When Joshua takes over from Moses, he gets the same command from Christ, who's standing there with a sword at the end of chapter 5 of Joshua. Take off your shoes on hallowed ground. Interesting remark. During the wilderness wanderings for virtually 40 years, 38 years actually, the tabernacle was covered, by the way, with badger or porpoise skins. They argue what, what that word really means. I suspect it's porpoise skins. But anyway, which is what they were shooed with. They covered the whole thing, the final covering. They had the embroidered cherubim, then they had the, you know, the, 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 the ram skins, over, then they had the goat's hair, and then you had this porpoise skins. And the same stuff they made their shoe leather. And those shoes did not wear out for 40 years. One of the miracles in the Old Testament. Boaz redeems the land for Naomi and also takes a Gentile bride to life and the shoe of the nearer kinsman becomes a big issue in the fourth chapter of Boaz. It becomes, it's an it's a image of disgrace to the nearer kinsman. It's a marriage license for Boaz. Check it out. And then John, here come it to Messiah. The shoes are not worthy to unloose. I think the shoes are interesting. I'll leave you to run with that if you're interested. Let me move on. These things were done in Bethabara, which means house of passage, by the way. Uh, down to Bethabara, beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. So it's on the other side of Jordan. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. That is a strange title. The fact that we're so familiar with it, don't let that rob you of the strangeness here. He's seeing Jesus come publicly the first time, and he says, Behold the Lamb of God. That's a Jewish title. That's an allusion to Passover. It becomes one of his most important labels. And even all the way up to Revelation chapter 5. Then he goes on and says, This is he of whom I said, After, after me cometh a man who is prefer, preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. That's his whole mission. It was a preparatory mission. John bare record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Baptism. Why did Jesus insist upon being baptized? Did he have any sins to confess or repent of? 
then why did he have to be baptized? He insisted on being baptized. Why? He was sinless. We've got plenty of verses there. We don't have to beat that one down. He was identifying with us. He was going to be in our shoes. You and I are Barabbases. And he's, Barabbas was guilty. He was innocent. They changed places. Barabbas was given all the privileges of freedom and so forth. And he took Barabbas' place. He took our place. Identity. This is his formal opening for the ministry. The event is commemorated in the Trinity. We see the Trinity. The Father through the voice, the Holy Spirit descending like a dove, and the Son being baptized. The next day, again the next day after John stood and two, uh, and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus, he walked, and he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. He's doing this every day. That seems to be his thing. Behold the Lamb of God. That's his bit. He's the advanced man. Done. That's it. Okay? And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And Jesus returned and saw them following and said to them, What seek ye? They said to him, Rabbi, which is to say being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? The Lamb of God. Introduced that way in John chapter 1. The Lamb was the offering of Abel. He got, he got Cain so upset in Genesis 4. Isaac was offered as the Lamb in effect in Genesis 22, the Akedah. And of course, Passover, the very label that is being used here, is a foreshadowing. Here again, we have the acting out of, of, of the nation of Israel. We got the offered as Passover. And these offered as a person, Isaiah 53, and uh, as a lamb to the slaughter and so forth, Isaiah 53. And of course, he's the kinsman redeemer of Boaz as climax in Revelation chapter 5. You won't understand Revelation 5 unless you understand the book of Ruth. And of course, he's, the lamb is glorified in Revelation 22. Okay, let's keep moving. He saith unto them, Come and see. And they came and saw where he dwelt, and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother, Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. Messiah is the Hebrew term. Christ is a Greek uh, adaptation, if you will, Christos. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is, by interpretation, a stone. Now, we can get into a whole thing here about the naming. We'll take care of that at Caesarea Philippi later. But anyway, the day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee, and he findeth Philip, and saith unto him, Follow me. See, now suddenly they're up in Galilee, okay? There's a, yeah, there's a, uh, anyway. We'll discover that Matthew focuses on Galilee, John focuses on Judea, and they, they even actually skip things from each other because they're of that focus, but that's all right. Just be aware of it. Um, find a Philip and say, and follow me. And now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. So this is a click here, okay? And Philip findeth Nathaniel, and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said unto him, Can there be any good thing come out of Nazareth? See, that, that whole term was a derogatory term. You know, I think in every region you have some place you really don't want to be from. Well, that was sort of the way they treated Nazareth because it was up north. It was uh, in the Galilee country in the first place and so on. But anyway, uh, can any good, any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, of whom is no guile. Boy, I'd love to have when Jesus meets me I'd say something nice like that. Nathanael said unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, because I said unto thee, I saw thee under a fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. The paraphrase is, you haven't seen anything yet. <laughs> and he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, hereafter ye shall see heaven open 
and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And that'll happen in many ways, but the, probably the reference here is to Matthew 17, the tra transfiguration, where that literally happens. Okay, that's chapter 3. Let's shift to chapter 4. The temptation of Christ. We're back in Matthew again. Before we jump into this, let's understand Satan. That term's the Hasatan in the Hebrew. They, they, this, there are two mistakes you can make about Satan. One is to not believe he exists. The other one is to be terrified of him and, and see him behind every tree. Satan is a person. He is knowledgeable. He's not stupid. He's very malevolent. <laughs> Remember the, uh, the uh, campus crew used to have a little, little uh, maybe they still do the little booklets, the, the four spiritual laws. You know, God loves you and has a plan for your life. Some of you came up a little bit, Satan has a four laws. He hates you and he has a miserable plan for your life. <laughs> they did a parody on that kidding around. But anyway, I always think of that one. Anyway, he's knowledgeable, he's malevolent, and he's a very powerful ruler. We need to understand that. There is a personal Satan, a real person who is your adversary. You need to understand that. There are two mistakes you can make about Satan. The first is you can pretend he doesn't exist. That's naive and dangerous. Or we can become so conscious of him that he receives more credit than he deserves. Let me remind you that the entire planet Earth is going to have a thousand-year period where Satan is bound for a thousand years. He's no longer an excuse. There'll be full knowledge of the Word of God throughout the world. There'll be no shortages, plenty of food. There'll be justice. There won't be any injustice. It's a perfect time. We call it the millennium. But there are some scholars that regard it as the most evil time of all. Because at the end of a thousand years, after everything being perfect, man still rebels. No excuse. That may be the point of it. In any case, he is a created being. We need to understand that. He's very powerful, but he's a created being. He's not, it's not Christ. Uh, Cook did a very famous book some time ago. It's a great book, but the title's terrible. Between Christ and Satan. It makes it sound like they're equals. No, Jesus created Satan. It's misleading. He is not omnipresent. He has location. We're going to see that when he's through with Christ after the temptation, he flees. He can't be everywhere. When he's not, only God can do that. Even angels, as powerful as they are, can only be one place at a time. They come and they go. They move. They do things. He has, he's a dignity. It's a rather astonishing passage in the book of Jude where Jude's main point is that we are not in fact, he's talking about apostates. People are that they sh you do not speak evil of dignitaries. That makes sense. But he uses an, as an example the most bizarre example you can imagine. He's a Satan, and he alludes to an incident that we don't think about. How when Michael and Satan were disputing over the body of Moses, whatever that was all about, he said he didn't rail against him. He let the Lord deal with it. We need to understand, you know, I, I, I've been in some situations where people are singing songs. I'm so glad that Satan's so mad, and, you know, they sing songs, that, and they, they make light of it in humor. Dangerous stuff. Jude tells us not to speak evil of dignities, and the dignity he picks as an example is the most bizarre one you can make. It's Satan himself. He's your adversary. He's dangerous. But you don't mess around with that. You don't deal with that. And if you're confronted with demons and such, don't be bluffed. But don't mess with that. Let the Lord deal with it. Satan's a dignity. And, and he is, he's real. He's powerful. But he is defeated. The victory is Christ's. No matter how much he might huff and puff and deny it and whatever. Let's move on. We're now in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Then was Jesus led up. A, then, apparently as a result of the baptism, Jesus now goes through a 40-day period of fasting. That seems to be a pattern throughout the Bible. Whenever you have a major need, but also whenever you've had a major triumph, that's a time to stop, be careful, fast and pray. The valleys are as dangerous as the mountaintops. When you're depressed and down, I think you turn to the Lord, great, of course you should. But when you're at the top and the peak and just been awarded man of the year by whomever, whatever it might be, that's the time to hide fast and pray. Here's the example. 
Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward hungry. <laughs> that may surprise you. You don't want to fast unless you do some reading on it. I'm not, don't go out and do it without some background. But you'll discover if you do a little bit of homework. There's a number of small books that are very brief, easy to read, give you some background. But if you fast, you want to get on the fast very gradually. Now, did you, you, you don't just stop. You, do, you taper off. But then you also, you'll discover the first three days are tough. First three days you're tempted. But once you pass that third day, a very strange thing happens. You'll discover it's easy. Up until about 37, 30, 39 days. Then you'll start feeling hungry. In a period of time, your system shuts down, and it's astonishing to experience. Unless you've got some, and you shouldn't do this without checking with a doctor. And most doctors don't anything about it anyway. You've got to make sure it's the right kind of a doctor that understands this. But anyway, the point is that uh, uh, 40 days sounds, sounds I, I made a big mistake once. I was on a 20-day. I was going to do 20, 21-day fast. And I was in it about 18, 19. And it, exactly what the book said. It was the first three days. It little, took a little you know, resolve, but no problem. Once uh, over that third day, it really was easy. But a good friend of mine was very concerned. The real problem with you're in a fast, you want to keep a secret. Everybody's got advice. Forget it. Um, but the one that suggestion was made, at least I'll take your vitamin pills. And I got, yeah, that made sense. And until I popped one, and I, oh, that was a mistake. See, my system had shut down. It didn't do any damage. Both Mario Lanza and Enrico Caruso died coming off a fast improperly, too quickly. When you come off a fast, you come off gradually. You go from water to diluted juices, and just you do it gradually. Anyway, you want to know what you're doing when you do that. But anyway, here he is. So he's been on a fast. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Now, this is misleading. The word if there is not a conditional. It's a, just a conjecture. Since you're the Son of God. It's not if, prove that you are. That's not the point. It's a mis that's a misunderstanding. And the if in the English is ambiguous. It really should say since, you see. Since thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. He could snap his fingers and have a desert would have been a bakery. Right? But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And uh, so, you know, it's interesting. A lot of lessons from this. We could spend a whole hour preaching from just this one issue. But opportunity is not mandate. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. That's important in ministry too. There'll be more needs than you can possibly deal with. You want, you want to do is make sure that God's leading you in the direction you're going because there's needs everywhere you turn. So opportunity is not mandate. Mission focus is essential prerequisite to success. You need to know what you're called to and make sure that that's what you're doing and don't get distracted. Our refuge should be His Word. It's interesting in all three, this is the first of three te temptations, in all three, Jesus will quote the scriptures, it is written. Incidentally, Jesus quotes always from Deuteronomy, not only here, but it's the book he quotes mostly from throughout the, the gospel period. It is written. He's, this is quoted from Deuteronomy 8, 3, uh, 3 uh, uh, and it happens, to, 40 years in the wilderness was for testing. He had 40 days passing, Israel had 40 years in the wilderness for testing. One of the seven I, am, seven I Am statements make up the Gospel of John. Seven miracles, seven discourses, and seven I Am statements. And the I Am, the bread of life, is linked to the man in the wilderness. So a, you can tie this together and challenge you to go. You'll discover a number of places in the Psalms and Jeremiah and elsewhere. The writer says, Thy words were found and I did eat them. The Bible is not just for reading. But praise, praise God that you do. But some of your richest nutrition spiritually will come from chewing on it, taking a passage and reading it over 75 times. Don't count them, but that's necessarily. I don't misunderstand. Did you chew your, you know, your, your, your mother probably said, did you chew 35 times? No. no. Uh, but seriously, digestion, chew it, uh, absorb it. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and sitteth him on the pinnacle of the temple. And saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Now he's misquoting Psalm 91 here. He doesn't quote the whole thing. Let me back up. The devil taketh him up into the holy city. Some people think this was just a vision or something, but the language implies they literally were transported. 
the pinnacle of the temple has a technical term in the Hebrew that shows up in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. He's going to offer... Uh, well, that's, excuse me, that's the, next, that's the next temptation. Let me just let, let me leave, leave you with that for now. He says, if thou be the, or again, since thou be the son, if thou be the son of God, but it's, it's not a conditional. It's, it's, it's not proof that you are. It's that since you are, cast yourself down, for it is written, he shall give thee. In other words, God has promised to do that in Psalm 91. To keep thee in all thy ways is what he doesn't quote. Jesus says, it is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Now, is that really true? Is there a place that you should tempt God? He says you shouldn't. That's the general case. There is one exception. Malachi. Call it Malachi, the Italian book, because, because Malachi gives you an offer you can't refuse. Doesn't that sound Italian? I kind of like that. Yeah. Prove me now. God dares you to prove him. God dares you to put him on the spot, to tempt him, test him in the tithe. That's a very strange thing for the God of the universe to put himself in a box. But he's put himself in a box. If you do that, there will not be room enough to receive the blessings you'll get. That's his challenge. That's your opportunity. Are you really there, God? Try it and see. And that puts the, that, that puts the ball in his court. But watch out. He has a mean serve. <laughs> Each one of these temptations, Satan... Uh, 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 is misapplying Scripture. But in each one of these, Christ's remedies is the Word of God. Boy, there's lessons there. We could preach on that for hours, but we should keep moving here. Now, this is the third one. Again, the devil taketh them up into an exceeding high mountain. See, they're actually moving around somehow. And showeth them all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. What a panorama that must have been. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Now, this is a strange passage. If I told you that for ten grand, I'd convey to you the title of the big golf course that, for which this town is so famous, would you be tempted to take me up on that? Of course not, because you know that I don't have the title of that. In other words, for this to be a temptation, his claim to title, his claim to title goes unchallenged. It's not a temptation unless the premise for the temptation is true. Does Christ know who owns, who owns the nations of the world? I think so. Satan is laying claim to them. All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall. He shows them all the kingdoms of the world are Satan's. That's not just here. The Scripture talks about him as the prince of the power of the air. He's the prince, he's the god of this world, etc. This world is Satan's. When you see tragedy, when you see millions of people, innocent people killed, slaughtered by whatever, um, pestilences, um, this is Satan's world. These all derive from, 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 fundamentally from man's sin. But here he is, the king of the mountain, so to speak. He says, all these things I'll give to thee, if you will fall down and worship me. What's he really offering Jesus? Jesus knows that's why he came. Jesus knows they're all his eventually. What's Satan really offering Christ? A shortcut. Don't go to the cross. Let's not go through all that unpleasantness. You just worship me, I'll give it to you. And then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written that thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. That's how Satan got in trouble in the first place. Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, do your homework. You know what I'm talking about. The ownership of the nations. You know, it's interesting. The God of this world is his title. In Daniel chapter 10, we have a strange, strange incident. Daniel is on a fasting prayer for 21 days, and after 21 days... He gets interrupted in his prayer, and this messenger comes, and he says, when you started your fast, I was sent to see you, but it's taken me 21 days to get here because I was held up by the prince of the power of Persia. 
until Michael came to help me, I couldn't get through. I'm here now to give you a vision. You're going to give him two chapters with the vision, 11 and 12 following. He says, but once, I've, once I give you this vision, I've got to go because of, and fight with the Prince of Greece. The Prince of Greece is 200 years later on our calendar. So they're in a different dimensionality somehow. But what that glimpse gives us, there's apparently a demonic prince of power behind each of these evil empires that are fighting. There's a cosmic war going on that you and I don't see. There was a prince of the power of Persia, a prince of the power of Greece. Is there a prince of the power of the United States? Absolutely. Remember Genesis 12, because that's a remedy to that. God promises that I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. God uses as his yardstick of popularity is how are we treating Israel. If Israel's got problems, that's God's problems, not ours. And they do have problems. But God blesses us when we stand behind Israel's right to exist. We need to understand that. People often, one of the popular questions I get when I travel, you know, why hasn't God judged America? Even Billy Graham quipped so colorfully years ago, God doesn't judge America, he'll have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Clearly, this country is long overdue for judgment. Why hasn't he been judged? The only answer I can come up with is Genesis 12. I believe it's our support of Israel that's been our, our umbrella shielding us from the overdue judgment. That's why I get nervous when I see us waffle on some of those commitments. I know eventually we will because all the nations will be against Israel according to Zechariah 12 and other passages. So what's the destiny of America? I don't know. But it's, it's going to hang on how we treat Israel. We need to re-examine our heritage. It's astonishing to me to realize how popular it now is, is to disparage our heritage. We have the most unique heritage of any nation on the planet Earth. David Barton and his, has a ministry called Wall Builders. Fabulous materials. You can check it out uh, on, in this regard. Look at the election rhetoric today. It astonishes me to see the depravity that masquerades as political debate. It's just, uh, uh, it's different. It's one thing to have a difference of view of how to go about what's best for America. It's astonishing to me to see major political parties disparage the heritage of America. The so called liberals. The military cemeteries of this country are filled with the bodies of patriots who died fighting everything they stand for. The whole idea used to be that character determines destiny. Not today anymore. Not today anymore. There's even debates as to whether character is a legitimate argument in the elections. It's the only reasonable argument. I've sat on uh, a dozen public boards of directors, and when it comes time to pick a new CEO, the only thing we're interested in is his character because by the time the candidates get to our attention, they're qualified. The problem is which one really has the character, the judgment, the depth of integrity that you're, that's what you're after. The others you take for granted. Well, anyway, after all this, the devil believeth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Now, when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast in the borders of Zebulun and Nephilim. I want you to recognize those tribal names. There's a very important... And by the way, a whole year apparently goes... Um, is inserted here. The whole Judean ministry that John talks about is omitted by, by uh, Matthew here. And, uh, but I want you to know something else in verse 13. When you speak of Zebulun, that's a tribal name, but he's speaking geographically. It's astonishing to me to realize how many people fall into confusion because they confuse the tribal names uh, from, in a genealogical sense versus the, the, the area. I can be a Californian in the sense that I used to live in California. I could also, I might mean I'm a Californian in the sense that my heritage came from California. There are four generations at Newport Beach on my wife's side and so forth. Generally, when you use a term, I'm from California, you mean from the board, from geographic, and that's the way they're using it here. When the northern kingdom falls to the Assyrians, we're talking about the, the, ge uh, uh, the geography. All 12 tribes were involved in both north and south kingdoms. The people that wanted to idol worship went north. The people that wanted to be faithful to the temple went south. There aren't any 10 lost tribes. You're confusing geography from, with uh, genealogy. Anyway, move on here. That it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, the land of Zebulun and the land of Nephilim 
uh, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, the Galilee of the Gentiles. The people which saw, uh, sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region in the shadow of death, light has sprung up. So Matthew here is quoting from Isaiah 9, verses 1 and 2. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was her vexation when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan and the Galilee of nations. The people that walked in darkness have seen the great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death upon them hath the light shine. Why is Matthew drawing on this particular verse? Because he's interested, his prophecies, he's quoting from Daniel 9, as Anakim, he's quoting incidentally from the Greek version, the Septuagint, slightly different but not important for us. What he's really pointing to, light and dark, we understand that spiritually, no problem there. He's pointing to Zebulun and Naphtali. And you've, that, both of those come from the prophecies of Jacob in Genesis 49, like we quoted earlier on the other one. Genesis 49, verse 13, talks about Zebulun. Genesis 49, verse 21. This is the region that Jesus' ministry is in. This is where the Messiah is really making his uh, beginning. Matthew's pointing out that the prophecies concerning those two tribes are being fulfilled in the fact that the Messiah of Israel is present in their borders and is beginning to preach. That's what he's saying. You with me? So again, it's a geographical reference. We'll move on. And from that uh, time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. This doesn't mean it was the first time they met them. He's calling them to service. There's a difference between just being a follower and being... There's something that's just as important here as cleaving. It's called leaving. They left their nets. This, these are not trivial things. These guys were partners in a major fishing business. They had servants, you'll find out when you study this background. They left all that to, to, to follow him. And going on from thence, he saw two other brethren, James and John, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. If you take everyone that's his followers, that's a group. I'm going to represent by this circle up here. Those are his followers. When you get to Matthew 12, from that point on, he'll only speak to them in parables for reasons we'll cover in, in Matthew 12, the general public. Okay? I really should put it this way. The people outside that loop of his followers are the general public. And to them, he only speaks in parables after Matthew 12. Are you with me? Those that are his followers, he gives some special insights into. Within those followers, there are 70 that are known as the 70. We'll read about those in the Scripture. Within those, there's a group called the 12. Most of us think of his disciples, we think of the 12. Okay? But within the 12, there's the inner circle. And that inner circle is what we're talking about. They were the ones that were present at the raising of Jairus' daughter. They were the ones that were present at the transfiguration. They were the ones that were in Gethsemane. And those three plus Andrew were present at the Olivet Discourse. Their inner core, inner core. That's what we're talking about here. The sons of thunder, John and his brother were nicknamed Sons of Thunder. They were fishermen. These guys were roughnecks. These were strong guys. Uh, they probably did Iron Men on the weekends, that sort of thing, whatever. I'm always amused that in all the little Sunday school film strips and stuff, you see John is always so effeminate. That comes from the Renaissance art. In Da Vinci's day, that's the way they visualized him, but that's, that, that's counter to Scripture. These guys were fishermen. These four... Peter, James, and John, and Peter's brother, Andrew, were singled out as an inner circle. And normally, just narrowed down to three, Peter, James, and John. And there are a number of occasions where just the three of them were, uh, were allowed to experience the transfiguration and so forth. The four were given a private briefing that we're going to spend a special time on in Matthew 24, the most important um, second coming passage in the, among the Gospels. We'll get there. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. The gospel of the kingdom. We're going we're gonna to summarize that in the next three chapters, glibly called the Sermon on the Mount. And don't tell me that you live by the Ten Commandments and the Sermon on the Mount, because you can't do either one. 
You can't live by the Ten Commandments no matter how hard you try. You should try. Don't misunderstand me. But you can't be perfect. If you think you can, you read the Sermon on the Mount, and then that removes all doubt. So what's the purpose of it? What's it all about? We'll check that out as we get together next time. Let's continue here. And his fame went throughout all Syria. And by Syria, of course, he really means what we call the Golan today and so forth. And they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with divers diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. He healed them. Now, the medical ones are not the difficult ones. I mean, there may be today, that's not trivial to heal someone, don't misunderstand me, but the real debate, what on earth are these devils and demons? There are many people, modern people, who think, well, those are just euphemisms for uh, psychiatric problems or mental disease or, or uh, delusions, whatever. That's not what the Scripture teaches. These devils are real. These demons are real. We're going to encounter a case where they recognize who Jesus is, where they acknowledge their destiny, and they plead with Him with some, for some very weird permissions. These are knowledgeable, malevolent beings that have a dismal destiny, and they are out to destroy you. It's in their agenda to get you entangled and destroyed. We need to understand these are not euphemisms. These are not figures of speech. These are sentient beings that are very powerful. We'll be dealing with that as we go. And he healed them. And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee, from Decapolis, that's ten, the ten cities that were up in that area, and from Jerusalem and from Judea and from beyond Jordan. So what are the major lessons? That covers our time for today. John the Baptist. Jesus in chapter 11 is going to say, no man born of woman is greater than John. Now that's quite a statement. No man born of a woman is greater than John the Baptist. You say, wow, that's pretty cool. In his next breath, he says something astonishing. He that's least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. What on earth is that all about? Does that mean John's not saved? What is he saying? We need to understand that. We've got to study John the Baptist. You need to understand John the Baptist is far more than just this colorful character up in the hills of the Jordan preparing the way for Jesus' ministry. He obviously is doing that. And his ex execution, ultimately, is, is a major event in the, in the history here. But um, what's he really all about? He has a significance that many Bible students have no grasp of. And to make sure you get that, I'll hold it until we get chapter 11. Okay? <laughs> the Lamb of God. Something you'll encounter if you mix with the rabbis a little bit. They have, they have, there's a view held by them of two messiahs. The Mashiach ben Yosef and the Mashiach ben David. Mashiach ben David is the reigning king. The guy's coming in power. The uh, Mashiach ben Yosef is the suffering servant described in Isaiah 53 and so forth. What has escaped the attention of many of them is that it's the same guy in two different missions. He comes first as the suffering servant to fulfill his mission. He's coming back as the reigning king. The first and second comings are in view. These passages are so clear, but they're so clear that many rabbis thought, gee, there must be two different people. No, same guy. Now something else I encourage you to study in the time you might have, and that's the temptations and their principal source. Where do the temptations come from? They don't all come from Satan. I remember as a kid I saw a little cartoon. It showed Satan sitting on a curb crying. And the caption says, those Christians are blaming me for everything. <laughs> There's enough residual evil in each of us to do enough damage. Satan doesn't have to help as much. That's what the millennium really demonstrates. The devil made me do it. The Flip Wilson theology, right? But one of the things about these we really need to understand, and it's difficult for me, having spent a career within the defense establishment, both in the service and the intelligence community, and as uh, chief executive officer of four different publicly tra traded defense contractors. This heritage, this country, means a lot to me. And I grew up in the, what I'll call the impressionable 50s and 60s and so forth, and even the Boy Scouts, it was God and country and so forth. 
I'm grateful that I wasn't in a position where I had to choose. And the great tragedy is the current pattern of things has put, us on, put America on a collision course with God. We need to understand this question of ownership. We need to understand when an allegiance to your heritage becomes idol worship. It's a very gray area, very difficult area. Having marched on Stimling Walk at the Naval Academy, that's very vivid in my mind. When other guys were in college, we were every Wednesday afternoon, we were marching in review on Warden Field for whatever dignitary was appearing at Wash in Washington in those days. Being part of the brigade meant something. Still does. And yet, things are different today. Things are different. During the Second World War, you could applaud the clarity. It was black and white. It was good and evil. It was clear. Today, it's the gray men. They even use that term in the, in the, in the profession. Nothing's black or white, crisp or clear. Everybody's being used. Ownership of the nations. Something else we should dwell on as we reflect on tonight's lesson is the cost of discipleship. The cost of discipleship is not just cleaving to Christ, it's leaving. Just as in marriage, in Genesis 2.24, when you get married, man shall leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife. There's a leaving and a cleaving involved. Same thing in discipleship. There's a cleaving of Christ as you understand who He is and what He has to offer. But that's also a leaving. That doesn't mean you just abandon everything behind. That's not that simple. Boy, I w wish it was. But there is a concept of leaving things behind. When Lazarus was raised from the dead and came out of the tomb, he was raised, but he was still defeated. He had to drop his grave clothes. Most of us are coming out of the tomb, we're saved, but we're still wrapped in our grave clothes. We need to shed those. He was dead, then he was defeated, but then he was dangerous. It's time for you and I to be dangerous. Raise the bar on your personal walk. Pray that through. Well, next session, I want you to study chapters 5, 6, and 7. I'm, not, I'm presuming we're going to take it all in one session. Don't misunderstand me, but read those three chapters. Do you live by it? Is it even possible? If so, How? What are you going to do with the Sermon on the Mount? It's tough stuff. It's familiar, but don't let familiar, familiarity mask what it's really saying to you. What are the primary lessons? Skim those three chapters. Do more if you have time, but try to figure out what are the primary lessons for next time. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we just praise you for who you are. We stagger as we realize the reality of who you are and what you've done for us, the extremes you've gone to that we might live. We thank you, Father, for Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, for not only what he's done, but we thank you for revealing him to us. We thank you for your word. We thank you for this gospel. But, Father, we also know that without your Holy Spirit, it's meaningless and look foolish without the illumination of the writer himself, the Holy Spirit. We pray, Father, that through his illumination we might understand that we might grow in grace and the knowledge of him with whom we have to do. Father, we do pray that you would take us and help us to leave as well as cleave. Help us, Father, to embrace and digest and appropriate this precious word that you've entrusted to us. We thank you, Father, for this word. We thank you for your presence. As we commit ourselves without any reservation whatsoever into your hands, in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen.